Hethkit Tube Checker IT 21, 1960. Vintage radios and the like have lethal voltage, so only personnel with the proper training should make or attempt such repairs. If you elect to follow any of the practices and procedures described here, you are doing so at your own risk and under your full responsibility. If you do not know what you are doing, do not attempt any of the following practices and procedures. This video is informational and not entertaining. This table of contents could guide you through the available topics. This is an emission vacuum tube tester, part of a series designed by Hefkit in 1949 and further developed in the 50s, sharing the same fundamental schematic. This series of vacuum tube testers was distributed as a kit, to be built at home. Therefore, most of these pieces of equipment have been built with imperfections, which requires particular attention during the initial troubleshooting. The original documentation, including schematics, assembly manual and tube data is available online. Before using the tube tester, even if it is supposed to be fully functional, at least an inspection is appropriate. The soldering points should be carefully verified. Tin blobs should be removed if they are found. The wires should be insulated if necessary. In this case, also the selenium rectifier is replaced with the silicon diode and a fuse is added. Please notice that the schematics of the Hethkit tube testers of the 50s contain a common wrong representation of the selenium rectifier. It appears reversed and only with the model IT3117 this typo has been corrected. It would be a good idea also to check if all the tube socket pins are connected correctly. It is very likely possible that a few tube sockets have never been used, and therefore never been checked before. To perform this test, the tube tester is detached from the power socket and all the levers start from the bottom position. A multimeter is connected to the filament 0 volts and with the other probe terminal to one pin at the time, moving the corresponding lever. The multimeter will stop beeping when the right lever is moved up.
The last thing to verify during the troubleshooting phase is that the sequence of filament voltages is correct. Starting from the lower value and progressing up to 110 volts AC. This test should be performed ensuring that the maximum filament voltage corresponds to 110 volts AC. If it does not, it should be adjusted with the aid of the set line switch. Unfortunately, it is almost impossible that the values read with the multimeter could correspond to the expected ones, and that should be taken into account before testing tubes. If the selenium rectifier is replaced, also the value of R9 should be modified. Very likely it should be changed into 2 kilo ohms. The value of R9 is correct when, on the filament output winding, between 0 and 110, the value of 110 volts AC can be read, and the meter needle appears exactly in the middle of the scale. The picture shows that the filament voltage selected is 110 volts AC. The multimeter, the yellow one, is connected to the filament pins and the tube tester has the meter needle in the middle. Clearly the picture is not taken perpendicularly. There are five resistors that, very likely, should be replaced, because the accurate evaluation of tubes depends on their correct value. Old carbon composition resistors have the tendency to increase their value over time. If that is the case with this tube tester, a tube with good emission, could be read as a weak one instead. The resistors responsible for that are from R4 to R8. The picture shows the original tube tester schematics, with corrections and addition written in red color. In the original documentation, most of the components appearing on the front panel are labeled with letters, as the picture shows, they also appear on this modified schematic diagram. This picture shows a rewritten schematic diagram, where it also appears the suggestion for a different value for R9. Finally, a more simplified schematic diagram could help to identify more easily, the different functions of the tube tester. This tube tester has two major operation modes, depending on the position of the test switch. When the switch is not pushed down, the tube tester is working in alignment, and short, test mode. In this mode, the meter is used to red volts, Precisely 110 volts AC in the middle of the scale. Simultaneously, if a tube is inserted on a socket, and properly configured on the lever switches, the short leakage circuit is operating, to identify the presence of an unwanted flow of current inside the tube, at least with the selected lever positions. When the test switch, is pushed down to position test, the tube is tested as if it were a diode, and the meter is used to read the amount of current passing through. A more detailed explanation is available, with examples, in the written documentation that comes along with this video. The pilot lamps are mounted on a bracket attached under the power transformer. There is only one screw, and a nut, to be removed, to let the bracket free, allowing access to the pilot lamps. 
The lamps are type B9S, 6.3 volts. The lamps are pushed inside holes, through grommets, which might have become too hard, and might need to be replaced. While using the tube tester, somehow intensively, at a certain point, the meter started behaving in a strange way, resting off the usual central position, despite the correct line alignment. This behavior appeared while changing position to switches, which made all switch connections suspects, but that wasn't the reason for such behavior. The meter is extremely sensitive, as it can measure 1 milliamp at full scale. In fact, it could have been just electrostatic on the meter dial plastic. However, it has been taken the decision to remove the meter, inspect it, clean it and replace the grommets. However, this is not a straightforward procedure. Even though it is not recommended to remove the meter, these pictures have shown the necessary steps, in case anybody had to do the same for whatever reason. The following video clips, instead, show the reinstalling process. For the occasion, some stainless steel, Phillips head screws are used, in place of the original ones. The pilot lamp bracket is the first thing to be removed. 
to access the meter, and also the last one to be put back in place when the meter is reinstalled. Of course, the electrical connection of the meter should not be forgotten. Here is what happens if one touches the meter dial plastic, even with the tube tester unplugged from the mains. The meter needle starts moving all over the scale. Therefore, the dial plastic should be cleaned only with an anti-static product, and it should not be touched while testing tubes. The following is an example of tube testing, using a 6RU6. The tube data that accompanies the tube tester documentation, suggests the following configuration. Type 2, filament 6.3, plate 22, top ABEF, bottom DG, the letter D is written in bold. For convenience, this configuration is represented here in a more detailed way, like this. The front panel knobs and levers should be set accordingly. It could be a good idea to start with the switch M in the position leakage, because if there is no leakage, there is also no short, speeding up the procedure. Before putting a tube in the test socket, the filament voltage should be checked. Instead of relying on the internal meter for the line test procedure, it is advisable to check directly the filament voltage, with a digital multimeter connected to pins 3 and 4, C and D, from another tube socket. The set line knob should be set so that 6.3 volts AC could be read on the multimeter, or as close as possible. After that, the tube could be inserted in its test socket. When the tube is inserted, it is possible to adjust again the filament voltage, if it appears suddenly too low. When the tube is warm enough to have emission, it is time to check if moving the levers written with light letters to the opposite position, to see if any leakage appears. The levers corresponding to the filament pins should never be moved, and, in fact, the letter D, pin 4, is written in bold. After the leakage test is performed, it is possible to verify if the connections are good, moving the levers on top, those that are not written in bold, to the bottom position, while testing the tube for emission. If the connection is good, the meter should show some reduction in the current. However, please note that often the difference is not perceivable, so, to be meaningful, the result should be compared with another tube of the same type.
In this case, only with pins 1 and 6, the letters A and F, this test is useful. The next tube shows a leakage between the cathode and the control grid. It disappears while moving the corresponding levers, A and G. It is only a leak, not a real short, because switching to short, it disappears. Testing tubes, without putting enough care, is potentially harmful for the tubes under test, and for the tube tester. Here are a few examples of possible mistakes. Excessive filament voltage. The filament voltage might be too high, due to a distraction. The filament voltage might be too high because there is a center tap and the filament is powered in parallel, which requires half of the nominal voltage. The filament voltage might be too high, because there is a non-centered tap, and the voltage should be adapted depending on what side of the filament is actually powered. Short circuit due to internal connections. The tube might have internally connected pins, which may be connected to any element, with no universal agreement between the different brands. The Hethkit tube checker family cannot leave pins open, and if a lever of an internally connected pin is put in the wrong place, that would provoke a short circuit during the test. The levers for internally connected pins must be put all to the same position, otherwise they would provoke a short circuit. If the short circuit appears between the lower and the middle position, that would involve the filament power line, which implies a significant current flow. That current would either damage the tube tester or would fuse the internal bond of the tube under test. This type of mistake is more likely to happen when the levers are moved to check for internal shorts or for open elements. The corresponding levers should be moved in parallel, but such an action is not always easy to make, and the possibility to provoke a short circuit is very high. Therefore, during a test, it is advisable to avoid moving levers that are related to internally bound pins. Building a tube checker like this one should not be so difficult, even without a prepared kit maybe with some adaptation. However, it would be important to keep some compatibility with the tube data, which, otherwise, would require a lot of work and contribution from many people, to be rebuilt. The following is a proposal from a new tube tester, keeping the compatibility with the Hefkit tube checker family. Please consider that these notes have not been put into a real project yet, and it is unknown if there are insurmountable issues hiding in it, while the previous pictures have shown only an early tube tester project, not related to the Hefkit family. The first thing to do is to isolate the essential circuit that should not be changed, for the sake of compatibility with the tube data. Nowadays, low voltage current regulated power supplies are affordable, therefore, instead of driving the filament from the power transformer, with so many output lines, such a power supply could be used. It should be possible to find something that would work, at least, up to 50 volts DC, which would allow it to operate with most vacuum tubes.
Using a separate power supply to power up the filaments, would remove the need to make a line alignment while powering up the tube tester, and, more importantly, it would let more freedom in specifying the filament voltage. If it is a current limited power supply, it could also be possible to specify the maximum current, according to the tube specifications, reducing the space for disruptive mistakes. Instead of the lever switches, more common and cheap switches could be used, like in this schematic diagram, using two stages, one switch would be used to tell if the line should be connected to the filament power supply output, or to something else, the other one would allow to choose between cathode line and plate line. This video comes with written documentation available from the links appearing under the show more tab, containing more details and better resolution pictures, compared to what the video could offer. In particular, associated with the chapter about the Hefkit tube checker, there is also a work in progress rewritten tube data, which will be extended in the future, without any additional video on the subject. If you would like to contribute to this project, donating old electronics equipment or old radios, in whatever condition they might be, provided that you do not feel any attachment to that, or not anymore, that could be helpful for my next restoration documentation and video production.